We are concluding our miracles series today. And it's been an amazing uh, three months, uh, not only looking at the miracles that Jesus performed throughout scripture, but even stories of God's miraculous power in our midst here at Grace Chapel. And first, I wanna publicly just say thank you to every single person who stepped outside of their comfort zone, sat in front of the camera, and shared their miracle story in order to build up and encourage us here at Grace Chapel and the broader body of Christ. I mean, many of these videos have been viewed thousands and thousands of times out in the community, not just here. So church, can we say thank you for all of those who have taken that courageous step. Also, I wanna give a special shout out to a team that doesn't get a whole lot of attention, but their creative talent, their diligence, and their ability to tell stories have really impacted us over the last several months. Our video team, John Bowen, Noah Shirley, and the entire creative team for all of their hard week. Can we thank them? Hard work. God bless them. Thank you. All right, now today on our last Sunday in our miracle series, we're gonna be talking about, interestingly enough, the very first miracle that Jesus performed. If you brought your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John chapter two. We're gonna start at verse one. John chapter two, this is the story of Jesus turning water into wine. John chapter two, starting at verse one. It says, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And so they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Now, This is the introductory miracle that Jesus performed. This is the first miracle that that Jesus performed. And what's interesting is when you read about the miracles that Jesus performed and all throughout John's gospel and the other gospels, oftentimes they're not just referred to as miracles, they're also referred to as what? Signs, signs and wonders. And what does a sign do? What's the purpose of a sign? It points you towards something else. And so all of these miracles and all of these signs that we've been talking about, they're pointers to something deeper. They, they symbolize something greater, something beyond the miracle event itself. And that's exactly what is going on in this story as well. In verse 11, John calls this particular miracle, he says it's the first of his signs. Now, what's interesting to me is if you were going to kind of do a grand entrance miracle. Like this is your first miracle. This is, this is a big one. This is like your calling card. This is how the world is gonna know who you are. And you think about this miracle in light of all the other ones that we've talked about over the last several months. Think of like Jesus calming the storms, having power over nature itself, Jesus casting out demons, Jesus healing the sick, even raising a man from the dead. And in light of all of those, changing the molecular structure of a beverage just does not seem like that big of a deal, right? So why in the world would Jesus choose this as his very first miracle? And there is so much here. I hope y'all are ready for it because I'm excited about this message. Okay, who Jesus is, 
what Jesus does and what we must do. Let's talk about who Jesus is because this is so clearly revealed in this passage. Who Jesus is. There are a whole host of people in modern Western culture when they think about God or they think about the person of Jesus or they think about church or Christianity or, or they even the, the topic of the Bible comes up, there is this abhorrence, there is this repulsion that they feel with anything in regards to the Bible. And we would call this, this is uh, what's referred to as post-Christian culture. It's the idea that while we still maintain and, and cling to the values, a lot of the values that came out of Christianity, we reject the source of those values at the same time. So we live in a culture that still abides by a lot of the values of Christianity, but rejects Christianity itself. That's what we're living in. And you say, well, why is that? Well, this sentiment, I, I think you'll find is incredibly common. It's essentially some version of, well, I grew up in the church and I grew up with all these strict rules. I, I grew up with, with a, a, a lot of um, limits on my life. And now that I'm older, now that I'm, I've, I've grown up a bit, I really just want to enjoy myself. I really just sort of want to throw off restraint. I don't want to have to submit my life to anyone or submit my life to anything. I just want to enjoy life. Because even among people who grew up in church, there is this idea that Christianity is all about religious adherence. It's all about obeying the rules and follow the, the strict guidelines of religion. And it's this idea that communicates that Christianity is this suffocating and restrictive and boring, dead list of rules that I need to follow. But do you realize what Jesus' first miracle tells you? It's incredible. Because he's saying, if that's your idea of Christianity, if you've rejected Christianity for any of those reasons that I just gave you, then what you've done is you've rejected a cultural idea of Christianity and you've yet to come face to face with who Jesus actually is. You've, come, you've yet to come face to face with what Christianity is all about. And that's what we find out in this passage. Look, in John 2, 8, Jesus says to the servants, he said, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. Now, in, in this story, in this culture, the master of the feast was the person who was essentially responsible for the entire wedding banquet. This would have been like the wedding planner, right? The bridegroom is, is responsible for providing everything that's needed and the master of the feast is responsible for making sure that this week-long wedding celebration, that it went off without a hitch, that there were no problems, there were no bumps in the road and this party hit an enormous bump in the road and is about to fall completely flat. Why? Because they ran out of wine. Now, in our culture, at a wedding, if they run out of wine, some of us might view that as a good thing depending on who's been drinking the wine. But in this culture, to run out of wine just a few days into the wedding celebration that was supposed to last a full week would have been an enormous disaster. It would have been a travesty and it would have tarnished the reputation of not only the bridegroom, it would have tarnished the reputation of the couple, of the family, even the master of the feast as well. So it was a big deal. So why in the world would Jesus choose for his first miracle, why would he choose it to be one where he creates 150 gallons of the choicest wine in order to take a dying party and lift it to new heights. Why would Jesus do that? I want to read this to you out of Isaiah 25, verses six through eight. It says, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. That's good news. 
Anybody excited for that feast? And you know what Jesus is saying here? Jesus is saying by this being his very first miracle, he's letting us know of all the things that I've come to do, of all the things that I've come to accomplish, my, my perfect life, my suffering, my sacrificial death on the cross, of all of the, the, the miracles that I performed and the healing and the redemption and the deliverance that I bring to the table, of all of those things, of all the things that I want you to know about me, this is the very first one. I am the true master of ceremonies. I am the true master of the feast. And I've come to bring you into jubilee, into celebration joy. I've come to invite you in to the ceremony of ceremonies, the wedding of weddings, the feast of feasts. I've come to bring you in to the wedding, to the marriage supper of the lamb. And it is going to be an incredible celebration. That's what I've come to do. Jesus says, first and foremost, this is who I am. And this is what I've come to accomplish. See, it's the father in the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, when the son finally comes home and the father sees him from afar off and runs out and put, I mean, hugs him around the neck and, and kisses him and puts a robe on him and, and the ring on his finger. And he says, my son was dead, but is now alive. Kill the fatted calf. Let's throw a party. And everyone is invited. That's our heavenly father. That's a picture of who God is. It's incredible. And see, for all the people that reject Christianity because they think it's some boring, stuffy, predictable, repressive religion, they have yet to come face to face with the real Jesus. Because in Jesus' very first miracle, he is staking his entire identity on the idea that he himself is the true master of the feast, the master of ceremonies. C.S. Lewis even wrote about this in his book, The Four Loves. He says, a secret master of the ceremonies has been at work. At this feast, talking about the feast that will come one day, it is he who has spread the board. It is he who has chosen the guests. It is he, we may dare to hope, who sometimes does and always should preside. This is saying that feast that's coming one day that every single follower of Jesus is invited into, that's the guest list. Anyone who's trusted their lives to Christ for salvation. This is talking about that Jesus is the true master of ceremonies that has been at work, is at work, and will host us that one day, the Lord of hosts. Now, that's who Jesus is. Let's talk about what Jesus does. In John chapter two, verse three, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now again, this is a big deal in this culture. The whole village was there. Everybody would know. Their reputation would be tarnished. But do you notice what Mary doesn't do in this story? Mary doesn't go to the wedding planner to solve the problem. She doesn't go to the master of the feast. She doesn't go to the bridegroom. She doesn't go to the couple. She doesn't go to the family. Who does she go to? She goes to Jesus. And see, what we need to understand is that Mary didn't know what to do, but she knew who to go to, to solve her problem. Mary didn't know what to do, but she knew who to go to. And maybe today, maybe for you, you're in a situation where you don't know what to do about something that you're facing. But the question is, do you know who to go to? Because if we were honest, many of us, our default whenever we hit a snag or there's a problem or situation or issue that we're facing, our default response is not first to go to Jesus. Our default response is to rely on our own rationale or intellect or wisdom or strength or strategy. And see, what Mary does here is an example for all of us because when she's first presented with the problem, the first thing she does is go to Jesus. So you might not know what to do about your situation, but do you know who to go to? And there's a whole host of people out there right now, and maybe you're one of them that are frantically trying to figure out what to do, but you've forgotten the one who has the answer for you. And because you've been going to the wrong source, you've run out of resources. Because you've been drinking from the wrong well, you're running on fumes and aren't sure 
what to do and you're trying to figure out who to blame. You've run out of joy. You've run out of peace. You've run out of hope. You've run out of love, of grace, of prudence, of patience, of understanding, of wisdom. You've run out of the resource that you need because you've stopped going to the source of everything that you need. And so John 2, 3 it says, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus responded, and just as a side note, I wouldn't recommend talking to your mother this way or your wife or even your girlfriend. If you do, she won't be your girlfriend for long. Verse four, Jesus said to her, woman? You know, we say we wanna be like Jesus. Can I just recommend that we not be like Jesus in this way? Or this might become our new favorite Bible verse. I don't know. <laughs> like Misty, I might just start. Don't do it. That's a bad idea. Okay, no. Okay, bad idea. Okay. Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And when I first read this over the years, I, I, I sort of read it like Jesus was saying, like, you're forcing my hand. I, I don't, I'm not ready to do this yet. I'm not ready to perform a miracle yet. It, I mean, isn't that what it sounds like? It sounds like, what does this have to do with me? It's not my time to perform a miracle. And then immediately he turns around and performs a miracle. It's kind of confusing. But what we need to understand is that Jesus didn't say it's not time for a miracle. And then after a few minutes of cajoling from his mom, say, oh, fine, I'll do the stupid miracle. That's not what happens in the story. This is the greatest movement leader in the history of the world. These things are thought through. They are calculated. And so what's happening here? What we need to understand is that every time the word our, our is used, either referring to Jesus or used by Jesus referring to himself, it's talking about a very specific moment in his life. And when you look at all of the other verses, even just in John's gospel, John chapter seven, verse 30, it says, so they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. John eight twenty, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. John twelve twenty three, and Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. And John 13, one, now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world. Every reference to the word hour, speaking of a time surrounding something that was gonna be done in Jesus' life, is a reference to the hour of his death. And so when Jesus responds to Mary, saying, my hour has not yet come, Jesus isn't talking about what it's gonna take to provide wine at that wedding. When Jesus is saying, my hour has not yet come, he's talking about the price that he is going to have to pay in order to provide wine at his own wedding. He's talking about the coming wedding and the blood that he's gonna have to spill in order to create the opportunity for us, the bride of Christ, to be welcomed into that wedding ceremony. That's what Jesus is thinking about. And see, at the Last Supper, Jesus says, this cup of wine is what? It's my blood. Whenever you do this, whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. This is the price I have to pay for my wedding ceremony. You know, in the Old Testament, God through Moses turned water into blood as a curse. But in the New Testament, he turned water into blood as a blessing. Right, and when Jesus is talking about wine, it's not about the wine, it's about the blood. And it's a blessing. But Jesus is facing the reality of what he's gonna have to endure in order to get us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. If he is going to feast with us, and us with him, if he is going to embrace us, and us embrace him, if we're gonna drink from the rivers of God's grace, if we're gonna come to the marriage supper with our bridegroom, Jesus had to go through the hour. And see, Jesus drank the curse that we deserved so that we could drink of the blessing that he deserved. He drank from the cup of suffering so that we could drink from the cup of blessing. 
And this is why Jesus is saying, woman, my hour has not yet come. It's not my time. And then two minutes later, he turns around and performs this miracle. Right? This is what he's talking about. He's talking about his sacrificial death that will make room for every single one of us to join him at the marriage supper of the lamb, at the ultimate wedding ceremony. Now that's who Jesus is and what Jesus does. Let's talk about what we must do. I love Mary's response. And it's, it's interesting. It's a little confusing. In verses four and five, Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And then his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. That has nothing to do with what Jesus just said. Is that not totally confusing? Like, it's almost like she just ignores him. Like, oh, I wonder if she's thinking like, okay, here we go again. My son's being disrespectful to me again, calling me woman, you know? And, and then she turns around and tells the servant, just do, do whatever he says anyway. And she, this is fascinating. This isn't even her party. Like, she has no responsibility at this wedding. And, and she walks up to the servants and she, she goes, Guys, look, here's the situation. They've run out of wine. It's gonna look really bad on them. And I don't know how my son is going to solve this problem. I just know that he is going to solve this problem. I don't know what he's going to do, but whatever he tells you to do, just do it. This is where Nike got their slogan. <laughs> and for some of us, we think, man, if, look, we think, man, if I just knew if I just knew what God was telling me to do, if I just had more information, if I just knew the Bible better, if I just had a deeper connection with God, if I was just more connected in the body of Christ, then I would know what God is telling me to do and then I would do it. If I just had more information, I would do whatever God wants me to do. To do. But what I found over the last 17 years of being in vocational ministry is that oftentimes, church, it's not that we need more knowledge or information. It's that we need to do something with the knowledge and information that we already have. It's not that you don't know what to do. It's that you haven't yet done what you already know to do. James 1.22, it says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And listen, Christians, we can fall into the trap where we spend hours and hours and hours listening and learning and being emotionally charged up and inspired. And we can, we can study and we can show ourselves approved and we, we can do all of the right things. And as we're listening and learning and reading the word and even believing the word, what we need to understand is that for many of us, that's where it stops and we are deceiving ourselves. Because we're hearers only, we're deceiving ourselves into thinking that our faith is genuine. James, James goes on to say in James 2, 14 and 26, he says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Right? You've got to take what you already know and put it into practice. Jesus even says in John 14, 15, just to make it crystal clear, he says, if you love me, obey my commands. If you love me, do what I've already commanded you to do. And all of this is telling us that what we need is not more knowledge, not just hearing the word or reading the word or even believing the word, as good as those things are, if it just stops there, it's not enough. We need to do something with what we already know. We've gotta put our faith into practice. So what do you already know that God is waiting for you to do? What has he already told you that you've dismissed as too elementary for your level of maturity in Christ? What is it that you've overlooked or forgotten that he's commanded you to do? Whatever that is, do that. Do that. 
Now there's something else that we need to see and there's something so subtle in this story that it's easy to brush past and overlook. And this one thing is so significant. And if we wanna drink from the cup of blessing at that ultimate marriage ceremony and consummation, the marriage supper of the lamb, we have to see this. If you wanna gain entrance into the marriage supper of the lamb, you first have to admit that you're out. You have to admit that you're empty, that you've got nothing to offer, that you've run dry. They were completely out of wine. They had nothing, no resources. They were in Cana of Galilee. And I don't know if you know this, but it was a little ways from you know, the nearest Kroger where they could run and get another wine bottle. Like they, they had completely run out and they had no solutions, nothing left to do. No way to scramble something together. And the way you gain entrance into the marriage supper of the lamb is not by saying, well, you know what, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like three-fourths full, I just need a little top off, God. Could you just help me out a little bit? That's not how you gain entrance. You don't gain entrance by saying, man, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I'm pretty moral, I follow the rules, you know, I, I've, I contribute to society, sure, I've got a couple of bad habits, but you know, I'm halfway there. If God could just meet me halfway, I'd be good to go. That's not the way in. Look at the story. You realize that Jesus does not lift a finger until Mary comes to him and says, they're empty. They have nothing to offer. They have no solution, and in the same way, Jesus is not gonna make a move in your life unless you come to the point where you're willing to say, God, I am out. I am completely empty. I've got nothing to offer. I've got no solution. I've reached the end of my rope. I have no resources. I have no solutions. I've got nothing to bring to the table, and I am desperate for you to intervene. It's only in that moment that God is gonna lift a finger and work a miracle in your life. See, in this entire series, every single story that we've looked at, every single story that's been shared from people right here in our congregation, every single story, it's somebody coming to the end of their own resources, their ability to navigate their problem, their ability to solve the issue. Every single story, it's somebody reaching the end of themselves. They've got an empty barrel and they come to God and God comes through and works a miracle. And that's where God loves to show up. Whether it's infertility or a hopeless diagnosis or even death itself, when our resources run dry, that's exactly where God shows up. And what's fascinating about this story, just an, a, another interesting fact about this, do you know who doesn't get the credit for this miracle? Jesus. Jesus doesn't get credit for this miracle. Guess who does? The stupid bridegroom that didn't bring enough wine to the wedding. He's the one who gets the credit. Look at what it says in verses nine and 10. It says, when the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of feast called who? The bridegroom. And said to him, everybody knows this. Everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you, bridegroom, have kept the good wine until now. And the bridegroom doesn't correct him. He doesn't look at him and go, I have no idea where this wine came from. And the the, the master of the feast is going, this is the best party I've ever been to. This is incredible. The bridegroom that ran out of wine is getting all the credit for what Jesus did. This is a perfect picture of Christianity. This is exactly what Christianity is. It's you coming to God and saying, I have nothing to bring to the table. I am completely empty. And God looking at you saying, hey, I got it. I lived the perfect life on your behalf. I died the death that you should have died. I rose from the grave in my finished work on the cross. Everything that I have earned and accomplished has been credited to you as if you have done it yourself. That's Christianity. That's what it means to give your life to Jesus. See, what's beautiful about this is the bridegroom is getting credit and he didn't even plan well. 
Like he, he made this huge blunder and Jesus saves his hide and then the bridegroom gets all the credit for it. See, you come to God with that. You come to God with saying, God, credit to me. Place on me all of the righteousness and blessing and rights and privileges that belong to Jesus because of his perfect life in my place, his sacrificial death in my place. Credit to me all of the blessings that are due him as if I've done it myself, as if I've accomplished it myself. And God says, you place your faith in my son, I've got you covered. And see, Jesus takes our sin upon his shoulders and places his righteousness on us. So you come to God with that, with that kind of prayer, he's gonna turn water into wine. He's gonna raise a dead man to life. He's not just gonna fill up your tank, he's gonna give you more than enough because in the story, he took six stone ceremonial water jars and turned them into 150 gallons of the choicest wine. But it's not just barely enough, it was more than enough. You know, we saved this passage for last because one of the most important principles in this story is that we serve a God who saves the best for last. And there's a day coming when we're gonna fully experience the best that he has to offer. We're gonna see him face to face in all of his glory. We're gonna, we're gonna feast at his table. This whole story points us to the ultimate wedding ceremony that's coming one day. And Charles Spurgeon on August 21st of 1887, at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, he preached this, and I wanna read it to you, speaking of the marriage supper of the Lamb. He said, then it shall come to pass that Christ will celebrate this marriage supper, which will be the bringing of the people of God into, into the closest and happiest union with Christ, their Lord in glory. Even now, the Lord Jesus is no stranger to some of us, and we are not strangers to him. Yet there shall come a day when we shall see him face to face, and then we shall know him with a clearer and fuller knowledge than is possible to us today. What that bliss will be, I cannot tell. Oh, the ineffable brightness when we shall see the face of Jesus. Oh, the unspeakable sweetness when we shall hear his voice. Oh, the amazing bliss when he shall manifest himself to us in all his glory. And there will come such a day for all whom he has redeemed, for all who trust him and rest in his atoning sacrifice. That will be the marriage supper of the lamb. That feast will be the fulfillment of long expectation. Yeah. And you know what that does in us when we keep that in mind, when we know that day is coming, that it's, it's an absolute assurance that that day is coming and that we're on the guest list. You know what that does in us? That that celebration, our God is a God that invites us into celebration joy. It gives us power. It gives us the ability to face whatever we need to face on the mountains or the valleys, the storms of life or the the calm seas of life, no matter what we have to face, keeping that in the forefront of our mind, that that's coming one day, it gives us the power to face whatever we need to face from this day until that glorious day when we see him face to face. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this glorious reality that we've been invited into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Thank you for the price that you paid so that we might gain entrance into the celebration of celebrations. And God, I pray that you, as we are filled and reminded of that incredible, joyous knowledge, that you would fill us with the freedom to be people who celebrate even in the dark times, to rejoice in our trials and tribulations as we keep our eyes on you and everything that you've won for us. God, we look forward with great anticipation until that day. But God, help us to remain faithful in our day until that day comes. In Jesus' name, amen, church? Amen. amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Go in freedom and celebration in Christ. God bless.